All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Tony, and I'm the Choices Market Kelowna Store Nutritionist. And um, I'm here to welcome you to the Restoring Our Oceans Through Seafood Seminar. So before we get started today, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping things, and then I'll introduce our host, Shiori. So for those of you that have attended this presentation, you're eligible for a nutrition buck. And so they look like these guys, and they are $10 off um, when you spend $50 or more in store, and they're just a little coupon. So a survey link will be sent to you at the end of this seminar so we can collect your mailing address. And all nutrition bucks will be sent out approximately one month after the event. And so also, if you have any questions during today's presentation, please type them in the YouTube chat. Um, also, please remember that you'll need to sign on to your YouTube account or create one if you don't have one in order to participate in the chat box on this video. So if you don't have one, you can just save your questions and email them to Shiori or I after the presentation and we'd be happy to help. Um, I'll type, I'll also be typing both of our contact information in the chat so that you can have that for whenever you need it. Also, if after the presentation is done, if any other nutrition or food related questions come up, you can visit or call your local choices store to talk nutrition with one of our in-store nutrition consultants or email nutrition at choicesmarkets.com and me or one of my colleagues will be happy to help you. So now I will get on to introducing Shiori. So Shiori grew up in the island nation of Japan, having a big passion for ocean conservation. Her interest in environmental conservation led her to pursue a degree in natural resource conservation at the University of British Columbia. She started her position as accounts coordinator for the Ocean Wise Seafood Program in 2019, where she applies her passion for sustainability communication through working with program partners in Western Canada to increase access and education on sustainable seafood across the region. So I'll pass it on to you, Shiori, and I know we're all looking forward to your presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tony, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here today and talk to everyone about restoring our oceans through seafood. Seafood and environmental conservation are two of my most favorite things, so I'm really happy to talk to you all about the combination of those two and what I do at Oceanwide Seafood to, to make that happen. Um, so again, my name is Shiori, and I'm the accounts coordinator for the Oceanwise Seafood Program. Um, so Natalie is my colleague. She was going to join us today, but unfortunately, she's not able to as she's not feeling well. But the two of us together, we work on the accounts. So all of our partnerships in Western Canada, and we support them with seafood sourcing and different events and collaborations, um, and then staff training as well. So for today's agenda, I want to start by talking about what's happening in our oceans and sort of the current status of fishing activities and seafood consumption. And then from there, I'll talk briefly about what the Oceanwide Seafood Program is in case you're not familiar with it, and then how we de define sustainability. From there, I will show you some common fishing and farming methods that are both sustainable and some unsustainable examples so that you can start to look for um, different methods that are, that are more sustainable than others. And then I wanna focus on restorative species. So that's the, the main focus of today's talk is talking about the types of seafood that are actually restoring our oceans. And then we'll wrap up with um, talking about what we can all do as individual consumers to support the sustainable seafood movement. I do have three short YouTube videos that will be played sort of in between slides um, so that you don't have to listen to my voice the whole time. So starting off, overfishing is one of the greatest threats facing our oceans today. According to the FAO's 2020 report on the state of the world's fisheries and aquaculture, 34% of global fish stocks are considered overfished. And overfishing is considered one of the greatest threats facing our oceans, but it's certainly not the only threat. There are so many other ways that humans impact the health of our ocean, as you know. Um, so plastics and other types of pollution is a major issue. Um, today, plastics can be found in every ecosystem studied, even in the most pristine and far away places. And that's a really big issue. 
And of course, climate change. Um, we all know what's happening with climate change. This is also a huge concern for the oceans and all of the animals that depend on them. There's the, the water temperature that's rising, melting ice, reduced habitats for various species. Um, and then with the increased water temperatures, there's impacts on coral reefs. So you may have heard of the term coral bleaching. That's when the coral reefs will lose its colors. Um, and then with ocean acidification, which is when there's too much carbon dioxide in the water that it becomes more acidic than, than normal, that actually impacts a lot of shell building organisms. So um, crabs, crustaceans, shellfish, it actually becomes harder for them to grow their shells. Um, so these three areas are, so overfishing, climate change, and pollution are the three areas that Oceanwise Conservation Association as a whole is aiming to tackle. So back to overfishing, which is the issue that my program, Oceanwise Seafood, is focusing on. So overfishing not only affects the, the stock and the health of that fish species that is being fished, um, there's also impacts on other species. So bycatch is a really big problem. Bycatch is the unintended or accidental catch of non-target species. So you can see in this photo here, this is probably a shrimp fishery. Um, but as you can see, there's a whole lot of other species that are being impacted. And that's because of the type of gear that is used that is not selective, which means that they're catching a lot of other species, including here a species of shark. And it's estimated that four out of 10 fish caught are bycatch. And then there's the impacts on habitats and ecosystems. Poorly managed fisheries and aquaculture are impacting ecosystems, damaging critical habitats like coral reefs, and affecting the health of many species. So here are just a couple of photos of just the impacts of fishing activities on different ecosystems. So on the left, you see an, an aerial photo of what was um, an eelgrass bed. So the, the green shades that you see, they were eelgrass habitats, but you can see the these are trawl vessels coming through. And we'll talk about some fishing methods later on, but this is a trawl vessel coming through and you can see that the ecosystem is being completely wiped out. And on the right, similarly, you see the impacts and the devastation on um, this time a coral reef habitat. So now I want to take a step back and talk a bit about um, seafood on a global scale and what's happening right now. So despite all of those issues that we just talked about, seafood is also the fastest growing food sector in the world. Global seafood consumption has more than doubled since the 1970s. This graph here is from the FAO's 2020 State of the World's Fisheries and Aquaculture. And the, the colors here that you see in orange and the, the dark orange red color at the bottom represent the capture fisheries. And that's the, the seafood that we get from the wild. And then the blue shades at the top represent aquaculture or farmed seafood. So as you can see here, most of the increase in seafood production from the last few decades have actually been due to the exponential growth in aquaculture or farmed seafood. And aquaculture actually now accounts for more than half of the seafood that we consume globally. And so when we're talking about seafood sustainability, it's really important that we talk about both wild capture fisheries and aquaculture. Even though most people tend to think that seafood is from the wild and it comes from the ocean and the fishers go out and catch them, it's really important to know that actually more than half of it is coming from, from fish farms. And as we will get into this later on, when it's done correctly, aquaculture can actually be an extremely sustainable way of producing seafood. So as you may know, seafood is also one of the most complex food systems in the world. According to the Financial Times, seafood is the highest traded food commodity by value, with global fish and shellfish trade reaching a value of 153 billion US dollars in 2017. Seafood is often flown or shipped across the world and traded through many different hands, processed and then distributed before it reaches the final consumer. And sometimes it can take several years from the point of the harvest 
to when it reaches the final consumer. So as you can imagine, this makes it really difficult to keep track of all of the sourcing information and to be able to trace products back to its original source in the water. And as a result of that, there is a lot of seafood fraud and mislabeling that can occur in the market. So on one hand, we have the seafood industry that's continuing to grow and expand, but on the other, there's still this big lack of understanding of what's sustainable and what isn't. In a recent study conducted by the Marine Stewardship Council last year, it was found that 88% of North American seafood consumers want better information so they can be confident that they're not buying unsustainable fish or seafood. And then 70% stated that they want to hear more from companies about the sustainability of their fish and seafood products. So there's a growing demand for people to, for this information so that people can make informed decisions when they're buying seafood. And from my personal observation, I think that since the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been even more um, exacerbated and people are, are, are wanting to find out more about the sustainable practices, find out more about where their food is coming from and if it's sourced sustainably and responsibly. So this is where our program, Oceanwise Seafood, aims to help out. Oceanwise Seafood, if you don't know it, is a not-for-profit conservation program that partners with businesses and organizations along the seafood supply chain to help them source and promote their sustainable seafood. So we have partners across the country using this OceanWise seafood logo to identify their sustainable seafood options and to raise awareness for ocean conservation. So our goal is to make it as easy as possible for consumers and businesses to choose sustainable seafood every time they're purchasing or sourcing seafood. And Choices Markets has been a partner of our program for over 10 years now, and they've been helping consumers like you find sustainably sourced seafood since day one. So a bit about the history of the program. The program actually started 16 years ago when chef Robert Clark, who is a very prominent chef in Vancouver, approached a marine biologist at the Vancouver Aquarium, wanting to be able to ensure that the seafood he was serving to his customers was sustainably caught and to be able to communicate that to his customers in a very clear way. So from that simple conversation, the program was created first with just 16 partner restaurants who committed to replacing a seafood item with a more sustainably sourced item and then identifying it with the seafood, Oceanwide Seafood logo. And 16 years later, we now have over 750 partners across Canada and beyond using the, the Oceanwide Seafood logo to identify their sustainable seafood options. So I'm going to play this video now and hopefully the sound will remain. Keep working. I've been around fishing all my life. My dad was a fisherman. I was always around the boats in the ocean. And I started running my own fish boat when I was 18. And the ocean is different every day. Is it gonna be sunny? Is it gonna be raining? Are the waves gonna be 20 feet high? Is it gonna be flat calm? Is there gonna be fish? Is there gonna be no fish? What's really changed the last 10, 12 years is, you know, the sustainable side of things. Different parts of the world, we got big problems. Let's keep our eyes open, pay attention. It's always been important for us to know where our seafood comes from because knowing your fisherman allows you to know and understand that he shares the same values as we do. Bottom trawling and other unsustainable fishing methods are so detrimental to the health of the ocean. We are very conscientious about how our seafood is harvested. I do everything that I can to make sure that we have healthy, sustainable seafood in our marketplace. Being part of the OceanWise program is the most powerful tool that I have.
As a chef, I care deeply about how my seafood is caught. Sustainability is not only better for the ecosystem and the environment, it's better for the fishermen and women, it's better for me, and it's better for the people I feed. Ultimately, it's about taste, and it just tastes better. Around the world, in places like Vietnam, we see fisheries thinking about how they can weave sustainability into the work they do. At the core of it all is one question. How can we ensure that we are leaving our oceans healthy and abundant for future generations? As the OceanWise executive chef, I'm proud to work with the incredible people that are looking after our oceans, lakes, and rivers. And I'm proud to be part of a program that provides me with the knowledge I need so the choices I make in my kitchen, at home, in my everyday life are all about sustainable seafood. Look for the OceanWise symbol for our assurance of an ocean-friendly choice. Okay, so that was a quick uh, intro to the program and you got to see some of our partners, um, including Chef Rob Clark, who founded the program, and Chef Ned Bell, who's a big supporter and leader in our program as well. So over the last 16 years, our program has worked closely with all types of businesses and organizations along the seafood supply chain, starting from the producers to the processors, the distributors, and then all the way to the food services and retails. So we try to work with businesses at every step of the supply chain to engage all types of people in the sustainable seafood movement and to maximize the collective impact. So at the producer level, we identify those that are fishing or farming seafood using sustainable methods so that right off the bat, those species and products can be sold as sustainable seafood products. Here are just a couple of seafood producers that we work with here in BC. So we've got Gindara Sablefish that uh, farms um, sablefish or black cod here in BC sustainably. And then West Coast Wild Scallops who are a very small, um, small scale family owned fisher family that uh, fishes for wild scallops here in BC. And then next in the supply chain, the middle of the supply chain are the processors and the distributors of seafood. So these companies typically carry hundreds of different products and are very well connected to restaurants, retail and food services. And we work with these partners to help them identify which items on their huge product lists are OceanWise recommended. And because we work with many of the major distributors of seafood in Canada, we're able to reach so many more businesses and consumers with these types of partnerships. And finally, at the end of the supply chain, we have the restaurants and retailers. And this is where everyday consumers will purchase seafood. Our restaurant and retail partnerships are really important to us because this is how we're able to tell the sustainability story to the consumers whether it's through menus, through the chef themselves, through gro grocery store shelves or fish markets. And the more consumers see and value the OceanWise symbol, the more demand we're creating for sustainably sourced seafood. And that has effects all the way back to that producer level. And across all of our partners, we offer education and training so that our partners all feel confident in explaining what the OceanWise Seafood Program is and what makes their products a sustainable choice. And we also make sure to really celebrate their sustainable products that they carry so that we can empower individuals to make positive impacts by choosing those items over others. So now let's talk a little bit about what I mean when I say sustainable seafood. OceanWise's recommendations are based on the most up-to-date up scientific assessments, and we take into account several criteria. So we at OceanWise assess the environmental performance of fisheries and aquaculture by looking at these three main areas. Firstly, is harvesting that ensures healthy and resilient stocks. Second is the effective and adaptive management plan. And then thirdly is limited negative impacts on habitats and other species. So you might be wondering where all of this information comes from. And the majority of the data that we use comes from the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch program. 
And that's a program that conducts assessments on fisheries and aquaculture operations around the world. As well, OceanWise also produces its own assessments for some small scale Canadian fisheries where a seafood watch doesn't have an assessment for. And then we're also able to benchmark our criteria to various eco certification programs, such as the Marine Stewardship Council or MSC, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, ASC, and some other benchmark programs as well. So when it comes to wild capture fisheries, those three main areas boil down to these four criteria. The first one is the stock health. So how abundant is the species in the wild and how vulnerable is the species to fishing pressures? Secondly is the impacts on other species. So this is the bycatch impact that we talked about earlier. What are the impacts on the other species? And then thirdly is the management. Are there strong rules governing the fishery and how well are those rules being enforced? And lastly is the habitat impact. So the, does the fishery impact important ecosystems or habitats? So now I want to take a look at some common fishing methods and their implications on sustainability. The, the first method I'm going to talk about is trawl fishing. And this is commonly used for species of fish that live on the, the bottom of the ocean floor, such as rockfish and cod. So in this method, a big net is dragged through the water to basically catch whatever is in its path. And as we saw in those photos earlier, trough fishing can be quite harmful to the ecosystem when it's used directly on the ocean floor. And this can be quite harmful, especially when it's used on important habitats like coral reefs and eelgrass beds. And because of this, this method is often seen as the poster child for bad fishing practices. However, it is important to note that when, when it's done under really strict management and regulations, the sustainability of trawl fisheries can improve. The next method I want to talk about is per seine. So seine fishing deploys a large net, kind of like a curtain, around a school of fish. And then it tightens at the top to draw the net together, like closing a drawstring. And this method is often used for fish that school together. So tuna, mackerel, and herring. This method can be sustainable when it's properly managed, but it's also known to cause high levels of bycatch in some fisheries. As you can imagine, it, catch, it can catch a lot of other species in these large nets. On the other hand, a pole and line fishing is a highly selective method of fishing as fishers pull up one fish on board at a time. And so if they were to catch a non-target species, they can easily remove it um, and release it without causing too much harm. This method is often used for species of tuna. And pole and line is also a good method to look for because the gear does not come into contact with the ocean floor. So there's very little um, impact on the habitat and very little bycatch. Harpooning and diver caught fisheries are also highly selective ways of fishing. As you can imagine, the fisher can be extremely selective and harvest exactly what they want to harvest without impacting or damaging other species or the habitat. And diver caught seafood is also often of the, of the highest quality because these organisms are not being damaged by gear or crushed in a net full of fish. In BC, we're very fortunate to have several diver caught fisheries, including gooey duck, sea urchin, and sea cucumber, which is what you see in the photo on the right here. Shrimp is another really interesting one. Shrimp is often caught from the wild using either trawls or traps. Trawls, as we saw, can have uh, pretty harmful impacts on the ecosystem, but traps are, are a more sustainable way of catching shrimp. And if you don't know, it is spot prawn season right now here in BC. So spot prawns are these beautiful shrimp that you see on the left. And, the sea, and during the season, fishers will go out and catch these shrimp using traps, just like the ones you see on the right. So these traps are set in the water for a set number of hours. And then the fishers will come back to bring them back on board. And this method is very selective 
because the fishers will empty the traps individually and then sort through the catch by hand. So if they catch anything that's not their target species or if they catch something like uh, a juvenile shrimp that is not, not ready for, um, to be fished, they can quickly release it back into the ocean without causing any harm. I actually had the opportunity to go on one of these spot prawn fishing vessels last week with one of our partners here in BC, Organic Ocean. Um, so I got to see firsthand how they do this and they were really quick with their sorting. They were able to sort out um, you know, different kinds of shrimp, small fish that ended up in the traps, even an, a Pacific octopus that ended up in one of the traps, they were able to quickly release them without causing any harm. So now when it comes to aquaculture, because aquaculture is an artificial system, there are so many additional variables involved. And so we have 10 criteria instead of the four. And I won't go into the detail with all of these 10 criteria, but they really boil down to having good data, low inputs into the system, and then low negative outputs into the environment. So for both wild and farm seafood, a score is assigned for each of these criteria. So four criteria for the wild and 10 criteria for the farmed. And the overall score must meet our standard to be recommended by OceanWise as a sustainable choice. So now I'll talk a little bit about some common methods of aquaculture. The first one I'll talk about is open net pens. So this is a, a pretty common method to farm fin fish. So for example, salmon. In this type of aquaculture, these large net pens will float in the ocean and they contain fish in the nets as they grow to market size. So here you see a diagram of what an open net pen looks like. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of inputs and outputs in the system, and that can be quite harmful to our oceans and other animals. So at the top, you see fish meal and fish oil going in to feed the fish. And we have to be very careful about where the source of the fish in the fish meal is coming from. Um, sometimes they can be from overfish stocks or um, non, non sustainable fish stocks. So that's something to look out for as well. And then because the fish are packed in pretty high densities in these nets, sometimes they have to use pesticides and other chemicals just to keep them from getting too sick, um, including antibiotics as well. And because the farms are in direct contact with the ocean around it, all of the waste from the fish and the farm go straight into the ocean. So this includes fecal waste, um, parasites and diseases from the fish, um, and then sometimes even escapes of fish into the wild, uh, into the ocean. And these can have pretty devastating impacts on both the seafloor habitat as well as on other species. So for these reasons, OceanWise currently does not recommend Atlantic salmon being farmed in British Columbia in open net pens. However, like everything else with seafood, the impacts of this method are very context specific, meaning an open net pen system in one place farming one species may be considered unsustainable, but a similar system farming something else in a different place may actually be OceanWise recommended. So because we talked about shrimp for the wild fisheries, I would like to talk about the, the farmed version of shrimp. So shrimp is one of the most commonly demanded seafood types in the world. And the majority of the shrimp that we consume in North America are actually farmed shrimp. And a lot of that comes from these, um, these ponds that are in Southeast Asia. So these farms are sited along the coast in tropical zones. And in many cases, in order to make room for these ponds, they actually have to remove the natural ecosystem that's there, which in this case is mangrove forest. So in this picture, you see the mangrove forest actually on both sides of the, the, um, the pond area. And so this, is, this whole area used to be a mangrove forest, but was unfortunately deforested to make room for these um, shrimp ponds. And if you don't know, mangroves are really important ecosystems for several different reasons. They are really amazing at sequestering carbon. They provide really important nursing and feeding habitats for a lot of species, including sharks. 
Um, and they all also offer coastal protection. Um, so they protect the, the coast from erosion and also from storm surges. And similar to the open net pen system, um, oftentimes these farms will have to use antibiotics and pesticides because the, the shrimp are packed in pretty high densities. And this can obviously have um, further impacts on the surrounding environment as well. Fortunately, there are other ways to sustainably uh, farm shrimp. And one of those ways is called silviculture. So I don't have a picture of that right here, but silviculture is a method of farming shrimp where instead of deforesting the, man the mangrove forest, you can actually grow the shrimp inside the mangrove forest, which is actually their natural habitat. So instead of deforesting, you keep the mangroves intact in place, um, farm the shrimp within the natural ecosystem, and then harvest them using really low impact methods um, by using the power of the tides. And because the shrimp are in their natural habitats, there's actually no need to feed the animals, feed the shrimp, or apply any um, chemicals or antibiotics or anything like that. So that is one way that um, is a sustainable, a more sustainable way of farming shrimp. And then there's land-based aquaculture, which is also a really innovative way to address the environmental issues associated with aquaculture. So one way of doing this is a recirculating aquaculture system, which is what you see here in this picture. So a recirculating aquaculture system, also known as RAS for short, is a really sustainable way of farming, of farming fish because as opposed to having the nets directly in the ocean, this system takes all of that out of the ocean onto land and grows the fish in land-based tanks. So because the fish are not in direct contact with the ocean, this addresses many of those environmental concerns that we just talked about associated with open net pens. So things like effluent, diseases, parasites running off into the, the ocean, those are all, um, those are all addressed by using these land-based tanks. The water in these tanks is also filtered and recirculated and reused over and over again. So this method is used for a variety of species, including tilapia, rainbow trout, sturgeon, salmon, and even shrimp. And this is a method that we recommend as OceanWise across all species. So again, a quick diagram of a RAS system. So as you can see, this type of system also requires less feed, and there's fewer parasites and diseases, um, and it requires no antibiotics antibiotic treatment. Um, and then the water will filter through several filtration steps uh, and then reused in the same tanks. And at the, um, the sediment that is actually filtered through can be used for different purposes like biogas or fertilizer, which is an extra benefit to these systems. So next, I want to talk about some really sustainable forms of aquaculture, which is bivalve shellfish farming. So bivalves are shellfish that have two shells. So think mussels, clams, scallops, oysters, and gooey duck. And farming these species is actually very sustainable because these organisms don't require any input. These animals are known as filter feeders because they get their food by filtering out all of the nutrients from the water around them. And so as they grow, they're actually improving the water quality and the clarity. So to farm these organisms, you simply suspend them in the water, either on ropes, in cages, or sometimes in trays, and just let them grow out to market size. And as you can see in the photo on the right, which is actually a mussel farm, these farms will also create these three-dimensional forest-like structures in the water, which can provide really important habitats for other species. For example, small fish or other um, crabs and things like that, that will actually use these um, habitats um, as shelter or for nursing. On top of that, bivalves are also some of the more affordable, sustainable seafood options. So if you think about clams and mussels, for example, they're usually extremely affordable and super delicious. And that's why we call them our sustainability champions. So shellfish farming 
is known to be a form of restorative aquaculture. And that's because it actually improves the ocean health as they grow. And if you think about any other food system, whether in the ocean or on land, it's really, really rare to come across this type of net positive impact on the environment because even growing vegetables on land has impacts on the environment, has a, a, a water footprint and carbon footprint. But this form of aquaculture and this form of farming is known as restorative because it has that positive impact on the oceans. So here is a fun experiment that was conducted by a group of people who compared how freshwater mussels clean the water as they feed. So you can see that the tank on the right has mussels in them and the one on the left doesn't. And you can see that the tank on the right with the mussels, the mussels have filtered out the nutrients from the water and made the water clear enough that you can actually see through it. And it's said that one adult mussel can filter over 50 liters of water in a day. So here I have another video. This one's a little bit longer, but I think it's a really cool way to learn about the, um, the sustainability of oyster farming. So enjoy. I'm standing on a pile of oyster shells. It's 9 a.m. It's a gorgeous day. I got whiskey. I got oysters. I got a fire. I got my friends. Woo! It's going to be delicious. Oysters, one of my favorite sustainable seafood. Zero input, they're filter feeders. All they need is a healthy ocean to thrive. Of course, they're delicious. They're incredibly versatile. We're here at Fannie Bay Oysters. I know my buddy Chris is inside. He's gonna make it delicious for us. Let's go. Hey, Ned, how you doing? How are you, man? Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. You know, I'm really curious to learn all the different varieties of Pacific oysters that we have on the West Coast. Well, I can't tell you about all the ones on the West Coast, but I can tell you what we have here at Fannie Bay. We've got our Fat Bastards, Sun Seekers, Virginicas, Olympias, Fannie Bays, Kumamoto, Shigokus, lots of oysters. Kushis. Kushis. And where they're grown really affects what they taste like, what we would call marijuana, right? The different algaes, different salinities, the difference in the ocean is going to affect the flavor, the textures, everything. I've pre shucked a couple. So we've got the Fanny Bays and the Sun Seekers there. So what I like is a little bit of lemon, and that's just going to bring out the flavor of the oyster. Oh gosh, it smells like the ocean. Briny and salty and so spectacular. Oh yeah. I love it. It's like savory, salty. I need another <laughs> one. <laughs> this is our apple cider shallot mignonette. Classic. Typically, like people are going to use red wines or champagne wines. What I use in mine is an apple cider that you would drink at the bar. They're so versatile, right? Like you can eat them raw, you can eat them naked, but then you can also eat them cooked, right? Fried, crispy, broiled, grilled. The world is your oyster. <laughs> You've been waiting all day to say I that, I have been brother. waiting all day. <laughs> nice. So these are our grilled oysters. Okay. So what we do with those is we take a small fanny bay, we shuck them fresh in the back. We've got two different types of butter on here. The herb and garlic ones. Mm -hmm. Then I've got a chipotle brandy butter. Ooh, baby. Straight on the grill. As soon as they're bubbling, they come right out nice and hot. Right. Look at that. It smells like a barbecue, like the grill. Oh wow, that butter is spectacular. They just are like sponges for flavor. I like to keep things very simple. I don't like to throw too much flavor at it. Just to accent it, right? right? To sort of enhance its flavor. Right. These are cultivated oysters, right? So they're grown for us by your water farmers. Our motto is tied to table. These are grown on the beach. What's interesting about that is that right now with the winter season, we have the tides that go out at night. So when the tide goes out at the end of the evening, then you go out and harvest the oysters. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Headlamps and everything. Really? Yeah. To get this awesome. To get this beauty. Spectacular. It is 1130 at night, and we're here with our friend Melindy Taylor from Taylor Shellfish from Fanny Bay Oysters. What are we going to do tonight? Uh, we're going to be harvesting some Fanny Bay Oysters. And not only have I never done this before, we have some awesome chefs who are behind me who have never done this before either. And you sound really excited. About it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's go take a walk. So five generations in your family that have been doing this. My first job was clam digging. Uh, it wasn't very good, so I quickly got moved to oyster raking. But <laughs> <laughs> my family's been farming in the Pacific Northwest since 1890. Wow. 
all of our oysters are farmed. So we actually start uh, from the beginning so we're fully integrated. We pick our brood stock. We spawn our oysters in our hatchery. From there, they move to our nursery system. Nursery system spread to our farms until it's time for harvest. And then we actually ship direct to quite a few of our customers, uh, as well as to our own oyster bars. Wow. Okay, guys, we've got quite a bit of a walk here, so keep up. Yes, boss. It's pitch black. There's a ceiling of stars above us. It's a perfect night. Now I have to find my perfect oyster. And there's so many to choose from, but I think I might have found my oyster. Look at it, it's still moving, it's still alive, look at that! Perfection. I honestly don't think I've ever had a more delicious oyster in it, like it, there's a taste of place here, right? The nice thing about oysters too is that they're all different depending on where they're from. Right. So here you would get that little bit of like slate-like minerality off a of Fanny Bay oyster because of the ground that it's on. Right. Oh my God! This is zero input animals, right? In the sense that you're leaving the ocean better than you found it. That is correct. They're out here filter feeding the environment naturally, so. Drinking the ocean. Drinking the ocean, cleaning the water around us. I like talking to Melindy. She knows what the hell she's talking about. <laughs> I hope so. I want to thank everyone for coming out to our farm, but this is where I actually put you to work and you guys are going to hand harvest some oysters here. Really want to get everything you can that's a good harvest size oyster into the bucket so they can get it to the processing plant so they can get it shipped out to all of our customers. Sorrow cruel harvest probably about 30 nets a night out here. Really? Uh, a lot of people don't know that harvesters are out here in the middle of the night. It's usually end of October through March, we're working completely in the dark. So they'll harvest into five five gallon bags and then basically net them. So this buoy will float up when the tide comes in. So eventually it'll be way up here, floating on the surface. And when it's daylight, our boat will come through, yep. hook, the, hook the line, pull both bags up, uh, and bring it into the processing plant to be sorted. Right. It can be a super labor intensive process, but I mean, if you just look around, you're just so connected with nature and you have to really be patient and mindful of what's going on in the environment around you and how you're utilizing your farm. Well, it's 1 a.m. We've been out here for a few hours. This is our harvest. Okay, everybody get in here and try and lift this. I think, uh, I think you're about to lose your harvest. Why don't we let the boat come pick it up, guys? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Well, it, it, it was a good idea at the time. Well, excited to have you guys back to the beach tomorrow to cook up some of these oysters. I love it. This is such an incredible experience to be right on. All right, I'm going to stop it right there. Um, after that, they just eat a bunch of oysters on the beach, and it's just going to make us all hungry. Um, but if you do want to watch the whole video, this is on the Ocean Wise's YouTube channel, so you can definitely take a look there. There's a bunch of other videos that are super informative and um, really cool as well. Okay, so another form of restorative seafood is kelp and seaweed farming. Kelp and seaweed are also a zero input aquaculture organisms because um, they just grow using the power of the sunlight uh, and the water around them. So to grow kelp or seaweed, they're actually grown on either ropes um, or on uh, suspended lines and just left out in the water again to grow um, to market size. And these species will capture carbon as they grow and they're, they can actually reduce the impacts of ocean acidification on a local scale. And researchers are also finding that using kelp as an additive for cattle feed can actually reduce their methane emissions from cattle by up to 90%. And other than um, the use obviously as food and cattle feed additives, kelp and seaweed also have many different uses for humans in food processing, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetic products. Um, so both bivalve shellfish and kelp farming are known again as restorative aquaculture because they actually improve the marine ecosystem as they grow. Uh, so one last video here that just talks about the different um, properties of kelp.
Awesome. So kelp and seaweed are also really amazing sustainable seafood options that you can look out for. And kelp and seaweed have been farmed already for hundreds of years in many parts of the, of the world, including um, East Asia, in Japan, China, Korea. But more and more so, it's, it's um, taking place in North America as well. So this product is actually one that Choices carries in their stores. So Nora Seaweed Snacks. This is a farmed um, nori or seaweed um, species that has been processed into these crispy snacks. Uh, so definitely check them out next time you're at the store. Uh, I, I do believe there are a couple of other um, different products as well that Choices carries um, in terms of kelp and seaweed. So yeah, definitely look out for those. And if you want to, um, if you're interested in learning more about seaweed as a sustainable seafood, make sure to check out some of our partners who are sustainably farming seaweed and kelp right here in British Columbia. So on the left is Canadian Pacifico Seaweeds, uh, which uh, they do both wild harvest of seaweed and um, farming of kelp. And they make uh, a number of food products and they also produced a kelp-based hand sanitizer last year um, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, so they've, they've come up with really clever uses of kelp as well. And then on the right here is Cascadia Seaweed, which is a newer company based out of Victoria, BC. And they, are, they have big plans for um, seaweed and kelp farming, and they just launched their new um, food product, food brand called Cove, K-O-V-E. Um, so they're going to be releasing their um, kelp jerkies and kelp chips and seaweed salads this summer. So definitely check them out as well. And then I also wanted to plug here that our team also has a digital cookbook that is all about cooking with only restorative species. So this cookbook features 16 recipes by Oceanwide Seafood Partner chefs across Canada using farmed bivalve shellfish or seaweed or both in some cases. And it also has a ton of educational content in there as well as some storytelling from the chefs. So um, definitely a cool resource to have as well. So lastly, I want to wrap up by talking about what we can all do as individual consumers. So the first and most important thing is to know where your seafood is coming from um, and to ask the questions about where it's coming from and how it was caught or farmed. Um, so if you're in a restaurant or if you're at the, a supermarket and you don't see the Oceanwise Seafood logos around and you're not sure if something is sustainable or not, always ask the questions. Where is this seafood coming from? What is it? Um, and how was it caught or farmed? And even if they're not able to tell you the answer, um, it still sends a really good signal to that business that their customers care about where their seafood is coming from and how it was caught or farmed. Um, and that sends a message to, to the business to be more transparent with their seafood sourcing and to source more sustainably and responsibly. And if you do get those questions answered, you can do a quick search on our seafood search on our website to figure out if it's a sustainable source or not. Um, secondly is when possible to buy local and low impact. So mix in some restorative species like you just saw, like oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, maybe try some recipes using kelp or seaweed. Um, and that's actually number three as well as to try something new. So uh, maybe not rely on the, th the big three of tuna, shrimp, and salmon, but try some other maybe small foraging fish like herring and sardines or um, explore using restorative species um, like bivalve shellfish and kelp. So this is the seafood search that I just mentioned. This is right on our website. Our website is just seafood.ocean.org. And you can actually do several different searches. Um, you can search by the type of seafood, and then it'll give you a whole list of all of the recommendations that we have. And you can take a look to see which options are OceanWise recommended and which ones are not. Okay, and then here are some additional ways that you can stay connected with the OceanWise seafood team. So we have a quarterly newsletter 
that will help you keep updated on program news and different events that are coming up. Um, and then we also have a blog page called aquablog.ca, and you can go to the Oceanwise Seafood tab to see all of our blog posts about different sustainable seafood products, um, about our partners, about events, and the science behind our recommendations. And then finally, our social media page. We're very active on social media, and you can find us at Oceanwise Seafood. And we do a lot of posts about, again, events and our partners doing features of different sustainable seafood products um, and showcasing all of the, the seafood partners that we have. And finally, we are currently doing a two month long educational campaign called Waves of Change. Um, that will go until the end of July. And we'll be sharing out lots of different blogs about the issues around overfishing, as well as the solutions of how we can address overfishing. We'll also be featuring partners who are going above and beyond to contribute to the movement. Uh, we have several virtual events in our calendars, such as um, different chef collaborations and cooking demonstrations. Um, and then we also have a pledge on the campaign website that people can take to uh, show support for the sustainable seafood movement. So make sure to follow us on Instagram at Oceanwise Seafood. Um, and from the link in our bio, you can find that campaign website. So that is that brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Uh, thank you all so much for listening and tuning in. And I would be happy to answer any questions that may have come through the YouTube chat. Thank you so much, Yuri. That was such an interesting and informative presentation. I learned so much, so thank you for I'm that. I'm so glad, no problem. Yeah, um, so I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat right now. So just a reminder to anyone to enter them if you have any last minute questions. I do have a couple though, just for you. So um, until, I see some more, I'll just ask yeah. my own. Um, so, oh yeah, where can, I don't know if this was on the Aqua blog that you just showed, but where can consumers go to find a list of restaurants that serve ocean-wise fish? Oh yeah, so that's right on our website as well. So when you go to seafood.ocean.org, you can find the partner map um, as well as the seafood search. So on the partner map, um, it's like a map that you can either search by name or just like kind of scroll and zoom into your area and you can find restaurants as well as supermarkets, retailers and suppliers that carry um, ocean wise seafood. Awesome. That's so useful. I know I'll yeah. definitely be using that. I didn't even know that that was a thing beforehand. Um, I, my other question was regarding trawl fishing. I know you how you're saying it's like probably not the most sustainable um, because of the big nets dragging across the bottom of the ocean. But you did mention that when it's done under strict management, it can the sustainability can improve a bit. How would they improve the sustainability in those types of situations? Yeah, really good question. So there's different ways that they can improve the sustainability. One way is the, the actual trawl gear. So um, by using smaller gears, for example, or using um, trawls that have uh, very specific, um, I guess, I guess like modifications that allow mm -hmm. bycatch to escape. Um, so there are some really technical things that you can do to the trawls to, for example, allow um, sea turtles to escape through a hatch at the back or mm -hmm. to allow smaller juvenile fish to escape through different um, openings and things like that. And that's to reduce the bycatch. Uh, and then in terms of management, there's a few different things that can improve the sustainability as well. So um, first of all, only using trawls in certain areas. So as I mentioned, it's, it's really um, impact. There's a lot of impact when you use bottom trawls on important um, or critical habitats like coral reefs and eelgrass beds and all of those. But for example, using it on an area that just has like a sandy substrate and there's not really a lot going on, it's not critical habitat for other species, then that can be more sustainable if you're limiting all of the activity to those areas. Yeah. Okay. That's really good to know. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's so interesting learning about all the different types, ways of fishing, catching, farming. It's, it's really good. And I feel like it's good for us to know that. All right. A uh, question has popped in. 
Um, so are canned fish, for example, tuna and salmon recommended or does the can method remove any sustainable gains? Um, the, the act of canning itself doesn't make something sustainable or not. Um, so we at OceanWise, we look at how the fish was caught or farmed. So if it was caught in a way or farmed in a way that is OceanWise recommended and sustainable, then whether it's canned or frozen or fresh, it's still OceanWise recommended. And actually canning seafood is, uh, in, in my opinion, a pretty good way to make sustainable seafood more available and accessible to people because when it's canned, it's obviously more shelf stable. It doesn't need to be in the freezer. Um, it's a lot less um, energy intensive as, as a, a product to carry and it can last a long time. So there's less waste. So in terms of the big picture of sustainability, I do, I do think that um, going for canned options is a really good way to um, stockpile on sustainable seafood when it's not in season, for example, and to make sure you have that um, in your pantry. Um, instead of having to go out and buy something that's maybe not sustainable. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And also it's so helpful with on the cans, having that little ocean wise symbol right there. So consumers yeah. know they're buying something that is sustainable. Yeah, that's really awesome. And I also um, find that canned products sometimes have a bit more information on, on the label. For example, a lot of cans will say like pole in line caught, um, and which is like the method of how they're catching the fish. Whereas sometimes in the fresh counter, it's not as obvious. It'll maybe just say tuna um, and not even like the actual scientific name of the or species name of the, the tuna. Um, so sometimes I do find that canned products have more information that I can use to determine if something is sustainable or not. Yeah, totally. When you were talking about pole and line fish, I like recognize it in my head from the cans that I've seen, but I never yeah, exactly. knew if it was just like a marketing term or if it actually meant pull in line. So that's good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any other questions pop in, but I guess to wrap it up, what's your favorite ocean wise product right now? What's your favorite seafood? Oh man, that's, that's really hard. Um, I am in a bit of an oyster phase right now. Mm. I grow through phases, but I recently learned how to shuck oysters myself, um, which has been a game changer because until then, when I wanted fresh oysters, I would have to go out and, you know, go to a restaurant and have their shucked oysters. But now I can just mm. go to one of our partner suppliers or retailers, get a bag of fresh oysters and just shuck them at home and just experiment with different kinds of toppings and sauces. Um, so yeah, oysters are one of my favorites. Um, but in terms of fin fish, I do love sable fish, um, also known as black cod. And that can that's caught sustainably here in BC using bottom long lines, um, but also can be farmed sustainably. Um, as, as I showed, the uh, Gindara sable fish is, is one of our partners as well. Um, so you have lots of options there for sustainability and it's super delicious. If anyone has not had tried it before, it's one of the most buttery rich fishes out there. And it's really delicious just on the grill with some miso and some soy sauce. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, yum. I haven't tried that before. So you definitely me. try. I'm yeah. definitely going to try it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll see. There hasn't been any other questions. So I guess we'll just wrap up. So thank you so much, Shiori. And thanks for everyone who attended the presentation. Um, it was a really great presentation. And just to a reminder that everyone will receive a survey link at the end of the seminar to find to fill out where they can enter their mailing address to receive one of the nutrition bucks that I talked about at the beginning. And um, you can also visit their, your local choices to speak with a nutritionist or email nutrition at choicesmarkets.com. And yeah, so we hope you all have a great evening. Thanks for awesome. attending.